Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. Now, in this message, I'm going to seek to answer a question which has been in my mind over a good many years. And I'll give you the answer which I feel has come to me. I'm not sure that it's a complete answer. I believe the question is one that in some form or another has come to many of you. The question is this, why has God tolerated for so many, many centuries all the evil, the wickedness, the suffering, the blasphemy, the immorality, all the inexpressibly evil things that have taken place in human history and which are increasing and multiplying today. Why has God not intervened? He could speak a word and the whole thing would fall apart. Why has he not done so? What is he waiting for? And the answer which has come to me is found in that passage which Ruth and I quoted. He's waiting for a special people for himself. And everything that he does in history is directed toward producing his own special people zealous for good works. A people that will belong to him unreservedly holy, separated, sanctified to him, serving him and glorifying him. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we hear a little bit more about that people. Not only is God looking for a people, but he's looking for a dwelling place, a temple. The word for temple in the Greek New Testament means a dwelling place a place where God can dwell. <clears throat> and in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, Paul says to the believers, For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Not only are we to be God's people, but we are to be God's temple. Now God has in the scripture revealed three main successive dwelling places for himself. The first was the tabernacle of Moses, which was outwardly not a very impressive building. It was covered with goat's hair, it was a small tent, Inside it had wonderfully precious workmanship, jewels, and so on. But looking at it from the outside, it didn't make much Im impression. And that continued until Israel entered the land of Canaan and for quite a long while afterwards. Then under King Solomon, God ordained a temple. The Temple of Solomon which is probably the most expensive and glorious building that man has ever constructed. I don't believe there exists in the world today the resources or the craftsmanship that could reproduce that building. It must have cost the equivalent of billions of dollars. It was lined inside from the ceiling to the roof with gold and the workmanship demanded incredible skill. I don't believe there are workmen in the world today that could produce that. It was a glorious building, a magnificent building. And yet it only stood for a few hundred years and eventually it was totally destroyed and left in ruins 
by Nebuchadnezzar. And then there was another temple built through Ezra after the return of the Jews from exile, but it never attained to the glory of the Temple of Solomon. And in the time preceding Jesus, a very wicked king, Herod, did a lot to or ornament it and extend it. But it was the work of a wicked man. And within less than a generation from the time the extensions were completed, that whole building was totally destroyed by the Roman armies. Not one stone was left upon another as Jesus had predicted. So what is there left to be a building for God? What is the most precious thing out of which God can make a building? My answer is people. I believe that human beings are the most precious thing on earth. Jesus said in Mark 8:36, What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? I understand that to mean that one human soul is worth more than the whole world. And the building that Paul speaks about and Peter speaks about also, he's Paul, he, it was quoted in the prophecy given, was to be a building of living stones, human beings. And that, I believe, is the most expensive building that history will ever record. First of all, expensive because of the price that was paid. The price was the precious blood of Jesus. He redeemed us with his own precious blood. Secondly, the material. It's built of human beings. And I find that humanity in general, most of us, have failed to appreciate the real value of a human being. We act towards ourselves and toward one another as if we really weren't of much value. I believe this is partly due to erroneous teaching which has come in through science falsely so-called and through other sources. In fact, I believe it's the devil's object to belittle the value of a human life to make it seem cheap and worthless. And unfortunately, many of, us, many of us and many of you have to some extent been deceived by the devil. You have not come to realize your own incredible value. As I understand it, the most valuable thing on earth today is a human being. And I want to take a little while to return back to the creation of man. I believe man is a unique creation. He was created in a way that no other creature was created. The others were created by the word of God. God spoke the word and they came into being. We're told that about the heavenly hosts, the heavenly bodies and much else. But when it comes to the creation of, of man, and his name was Adam, and you need to bear in mind that when the Bible speaks about the sons of man, it's saying the sons of Adam. And his name had a double meaning. The, word for, the, the Hebrew word for earth is Adamah, so he was built out of earth. And then the word Dam means blood. So he was made out of earth, but blood flowed in his veins. And one of the things that impresses me about the Bible is it says so much in such a short space. And the whole creation of man is described in one verse. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, And the Lord God, Jehovah God, formed man Adam of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life 
and man became a living soul. I don't know whether you've ever pictured this, but it's become very vivid to me. The great creator, and we are told that God the Father created everything through Jesus Christ, the Son. So, the Son of God, the eternal Son, the second person of the Godhead, must have kneeled down and taken the clay and molded it and formed it into a human body, the body of a man. And I suppose that was the most perfect piece of artwork that earth has ever seen. More beautiful than anything that Michelangelo or the other great sculptors or painters have ever produced. It was a perfect work formed by the hands of God. But all it was, was clay. And then, you see, every time God deals with man, he stoops. So the Creator stooped and put his lips against the lips of clay and his nostrils against the nostrils of clay and it says he breathed into him the breath of life. The Hebrew language is one of those languages in which the words by their sound indicate in a way the meaning. And the Hebrew word for he breathed is vayepah. It's a very forceful word. If you've studied phonetics, the, word, the letter P is a plosive. It's a, it's a letter that indicates an explosion. When you say a P, you, have, you make an explosion. I don't know whether I can demonstrate this, but I'll say the word pip, and you watch the paper. Pip. And you see, the explosion moves the paper. And then the next main letter is the letter het, which English-speaking people can't make. Scots can make it, Irish can make it, but English can't. Het. It's a guttural, prolonged sound. So it's vayepah. And that word indicates a tremendous inbreathing of the spirit of life from God. And think of what it did. It produced a living human being. With all the wonderful organs and functions of humanity. Eyes, lips, a heart, a blood system, a nervous system. All sorts of things that I don't even understand. Just think how it came to be. By the in-breathed breath of God, that form of clay was changed into, I think, the apex of God's creation. The thing that he had given the most attention to, more attention than to the angels, or the stars, or the mountains. Man became a living soul. God breathed a little bit of himself into humanity. And God has been seeking that which he breathed into man ever since. Because through Satan's cunning and man's rebellion, that inbreathed soul was cut off from God. But Jesus said Luke, in Luke 16 verse 19, verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God sent Jesus to recover what he had breathed into humanity and the devil had stolen. And there's a verse in James chapter 4, verse 5, which is translated in various ways, in various translations. I happen to have learned Greek since I was 10 years old and that doesn't make me an expert but it entitles me to my opinion. <laughs> and one translation, the New American Standard, 
I believe, correctly translates this verse. And it makes sense. It says, he, that's God, jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. So God has a jealous longing for that spirit that he breathed into man at creation. And he sent Jesus to seek and to save that which was lost. Now I think that the number one problem of humanity, and if I were to leave you opportunity to guess, you'd probably give me a lot of different answers. But I think the number one problem of humanity, the root of all our problems, is we do not appreciate our own value. We don't realize that we are the most valuable thing that God produced. It's tragic. And you see, God's enemy, the devil, takes a special delight in disfiguring the likeness of God which was in man. He takes a special delight in dragging man down to the gutter and making him behave in a way that is lower than that of the animals. Because Satan has an in, inexhaustible hatred for God. He cannot touch God, but he can touch God's image in man. I remember many years back, one of my daughters, who is not here, let me say, was engaged to a certain man, and she carried his photograph around with him. And then she got a letter from him, breaking off the engagement. And I'm not saying this was the spiritual reaction, but she tore his photo up. And I think in a way that's what the devil wants to do, is tear the photo up, destroy the likeness of God in man. I think many of us, perhaps all of us in a way, could be compared to a person who holds in his hand an inexpressibly beautiful diamond. And he trades it in for a packet of cigarettes or for a ticket to a movie. See, that's what we've all done. We've sold ourselves for things infinitely less valuable than what God has put in us. But Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, to get back God's stolen property. See, that's what you and I are. We're God's property, but the devil stole us. The devil tricked us. He made us despise the diamond and just trade it for something so cheap and valueless that we can be ashamed and astonished at what we've done, each of us. I'm not talking just about alcoholics or drug addicts. I'm talking about humanity as a whole. All of us, at one time or another, have made ourselves very cheap. We've let go of the most precious thing for something of relatively no value at all. And so Jesus came to get a people for himself, to seek and to save that which was lost, to bring it back to himself, and to make a people who would be totally his own. I love that phrase that Ruth and I repeated. He redeemed us from every lawless deed that he might purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good work. Pause for a moment and consider what it means that God wants you to be part of his own special people.
Those whom God has redeemed are the most special people on earth. And it's for our sakes that God continues to tolerate all the evil, the agony, the suffering. Because he's going to get a people for himself out of it all. But we have to respond. Jesus has done his part. We have to do our part to be part of that special people. And I want to speak just about two things that God requires of us. The first is purity. And purity that has an eternal perspective that can look beyond time and into eternity. You see, Christians were not designed to live for time. We were designed to live for eternity. We were designed to have eternity always in view. But I would say in this nation and many other Western nations, the majority of professing Christians have lost the view of eternity. They think only in terms of time. Paul had something to say which I think applies to our contemporary generation. I was talking to one of the young ladies that is with us and she was saying, she's age 26, this is the X generation. There's nothing more left for us to rebel against. We are a kind of hopeless people. What is there left for us in life? And as I meditated on that, I saw that Paul had diagnosed the problem. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If you have your Bibles, it would be good to turn to that because it's such a powerful verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable, the most miserable. In other words, if we claim to be Christians, but all we are looking for is things in this life, we are the most miserable, the most pitiable of all people. And that's why you meet so many miserable Christians. Because they have no expectation beyond what they can get in this life. Food, clothing, money, success, a home, maybe even a family. But their eyes never go beyond the limits of time. And we are not designed for that. We're designed to be a people with eternity in our hearts. Some years ago, I became very sick when I was in Hawaii. and. Uh, I wasn't afraid of dying, although it could have led to death. But I wanted to have an answer. God, I've always believed in divine healing. I've always preached divine healing. I've seen countless people healed. What's wrong? Why am I not being healed? And it was as if I had an interview with the Lord. I don't know if this is what it will like, be like to be before the judgment seat of Christ, but it says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to say he never condemned me. He was very um, impersonal in a way. But he just took my mind back over scene after scene in my career as a minister a full gospel minister, a charismatic minister. And he showed me how carnal I had been. Now I want to say, just to avoid misunderstanding, by the grace of God, I've never been guilty of drunkenness or immorality or misappropriating funds, which is the things that people always expect when preachers confess sin. 
and so quite often they're right too. But God showed me, the Lord Jesus showed me how carnal I had been. And he took me to various scenes. Quite a number of them were in restaurants. And he showed me the essence of carnality is to live at any time as if there's nothing beyond this life. And the moment you live like that, you may not be committing obvious sins, but you're carnal, you're living in the flesh, you're missing the whole ultimate purpose of God for his redeemed people. Because you remember that scripture that said, that we've quoted, said, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Every one of us should be continually, every day, looking for the blessed hope. When you lose sight of that, you're carnal. You've lost sight of eternity, and you can still use religious language, and attend church, and say prayers, but you've lost the joy of the Lord. I've observed something that surprised me in my travels and meeting many people. Very often the Christians who had the least in this world, who were poor and persecuted, had the greatest joy, much greater joy than others who had much more in this life. And I came to realize it was because they were focused on eternity. They were looking for what lay ahead. And so, dear brother or sister, if you're not happy, you're a Christian, but you're unfulfilled, you're frustrated, you may even be angry with God because he hasn't done the things you wanted him to do for you. Let me suggest to you, your basic problem is you've lost the vision of eternity. You're only expecting things in this life. Of course, you believe you'll go to heaven when you die. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a vision for eternity. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, Paul says, the most to be pitied. There's nobody else quite so miserable as the Christian who's lost the vision of eternity. Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. I love that phrase that Ruth and I repeated. He redeemed us from every lawless deed that he might purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Pause for a moment and consider what it means that God wants you to be part of his own special people. Those whom God has redeemed are the most special people on earth. And it's for our sakes that God continues to tolerate all the evil, the agony, the suffering, because he's going to get 
a people for himself out of it all. But we have to respond. Jesus has done his part. We have to do our part to be part of that special people. And I want to speak just about two things that God requires of us. The first is purity. And purity that has an eternal perspective that can look beyond time and into eternity. You see, Christians were not designed to live for time. We were designed to live for eternity. We were designed to have eternity always in view. But I would say in this nation and many other Western nations, the majority of professing Christians have lost the view of eternity. They think only in terms of time. Paul had something to say which I think applies to our contemporary generation. I was talking to one of the young ladies that is with us and she was saying, she's aged 26, this is the X generation. There's nothing more left for us to rebel against. We are a kind of hopeless people. What is there left for us in life? And as I meditated on that, I saw that Paul had diagnosed the problem. And he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If you have your Bibles, it would be good to turn there because it's such a powerful verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable, the most miserable. In other words, if we claim to be Christians, but all we are looking for is things in this life, we are the most miserable, the most pitiable of all people. And that's why you meet so many miserable Christians. Because they have no expectation beyond what they can get in this life. Food, clothing, money, success, a home, maybe even a family. But their eyes never go beyond the limits of time. And we are not designed for that. We're designed to be a people with eternity in our hearts. Some years ago, I became very sick when I was in Hawaii. and. Uh, I wasn't afraid of dying, although it could have led to death. But I wanted to have an answer. God, I've always believed in divine healing. I've always preached divine healing. I've seen countless people healed. What's wrong? Why am I not being healed? And it was as if I had an interview with the Lord. I don't know if this is what it will like, be like to be before the judgment seat of Christ, but it says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to say he never condemned me. He was very um, impersonal in a way. But he just took my mind back over scene after scene in my career as a minister a full gospel minister, a charismatic minister. And he showed me how carnal I had been. Now I want to say, just to avoid misunderstanding, by the grace of God, I've never been guilty of drunkenness or immorality or misappropriating funds, which is the things that people always expect when preachers confess sin. And some, quite often they're right too. But God showed me, the Lord Jesus showed me how carnal I had been. And he took me to various scenes. Quite a number of them were in restaurants. 
And he showed me the essence of carnality is to live at any time as if there's nothing beyond this life. And the moment you live like that, you may not be committing obvious sins, but you're carnal. You're living in the flesh. You're missing the whole ultimate purpose of God for his redeemed people. Because you remember that scripture that said, that we've quoted, said, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Every one of us should be continually, every day, looking for the blessed hope. When you lose sight of that, you're carnal. You've lost sight of eternity, and you can still use religious language, and attend church, and say prayers, but you've lost the joy of the Lord. I've observed something that surprised me in my travels and meeting many of you. Very often the Christians who had the least in this world, who were poor and persecuted, had the greatest joy, much greater joy than others who had much more in this life. And I came to realize it was because they were focused on eternity. They were looking for what lay ahead. And so, dear brother or sister, if you're not happy, you're a Christian, but you're unfulfilled, you're frustrated, you may even be angry with God because he hasn't done the things he wanted him to do for you, let me suggest to you, your basic problem is You've lost the vision of eternity. You're only expecting things in this life. Of course, you believe you'll go to heaven when you die. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a vision for eternity. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, Paul says, the most to be pitied. There's nobody else quite so miserable as the Christian who's lost the vision of eternity. Now, I said that Jesus requires certain things. And the first was purity. And it's a two-way operation. Because the passage that I quoted from Titus chapter 2 says he gave himself that he might purify his own special people. So the process of purifying begins on God's end. But that's not where it ends. We have to respond by purifying ourselves. And I want to give you two scriptures that are very clear about that. The first is in 1 John chapter 3. Beautiful words, that I'm sure familiar to many of you. The first three verses. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and we are. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's our eternal hope, that we will see Jesus, and when we see him, we'll be like him. But then John goes on to say in the next verse, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So what is the evidence that you're really hoping to meet Jesus? What will be the effect in, effect in your life? It's very clear. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Jesus purifies us. We have to purify ourselves. And God has only got one standard of purity just as he is pure. 
That's our responsibility. That's the evidence that we really are looking for the return of the Lord. Everyone who has this hope of the return of the Lord purifies himself as he is pure. Brothers and sisters, I want to say to you very clearly, if you are not purifying yourself, you may believe doctrinally in the return of the Lord, but effectively you're denying what you say you believe. Because the mark that you believe it is that you purify yourself just as he is pure. And then going back to the passage in 2 Corinthians where we spoke about being the temple of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll go back to those verses and read on. For you, or we, some texts say, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's glorious. But it's not the end. The next word is therefore. In other words, because of this, how do we respond? And Paul says, come out from among them. That's the people that are not living for God. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Notice there's a condition upon which God will be our Father. It is that we come out from everything that is ungodly and we do not touch what is unclean. Now there are many, many ways of touching what is unclean. But I think the commonest way for American Christians is television. There is so much that is impure and unclean and you don't have to watch it. And when you do watch it, you are touching what is unclean. And it makes you unclean. It, it makes your thinking unclean. It gives you unclean suggestions. It gives you false standards. You begin to permit yourself to do things you would never do if you hadn't seen somebody do them on television. I'm not as such against television. It has its benefits. Not many, but some. <laughs> I have to say I'm not totally in favor of preaching on television. Some of it we'd be better without. But you need to be a, a God. In 1986, some people here will remember, Ruth remembers and some of the rest of you. We had a visitation in Good News Church when it was still in the old building. And believe it or not, we were up by 5 a.m. and there for meeting with God for about, I think, six weeks. And I, and I can see some of you nodding your heads, you can remember. What was interesting was that the small children in the various families didn't want to miss that meeting. If their parents went without them, when the parents got home they said, why didn't you take us? And they would just curl up in a blanket and lie on the floor. And I tell you, I got to know the smell of the carpet and Good News Church so well, I'll never forget it. Because I had my nose into it for hours. There wasn't a lot of praying, practically no prophesying. We were just in the presence of God. And one of the things, and then people began to confess their sins. That wasn't immediate. There were sins of adultery, alcoholism, and others amongst good church members. But I think the commonest sin that was confessed was idolatry. Many people confessed they had an idol in their home. And it was, don't have to I'll tell you, do I? It was the TV set. And they worshipped before that. Now, they repented, and I wonder how many of them are still repentant. 
but it's touching the unclean thing. Now there are many, many other ways we can touch the unclean thing, but I think that's, when you can deal with that, you can deal with most of the rest. I was preaching in Zambia, if you know where that is, in central West Africa, or West Central Africa, whatever you like to say. And we were out in a really remote place where they just got their first telephone. And I was preaching on addictions. And I should have known better. I usually I'm careful, I take my audience into account. But I said there's a, there's a new addiction that's come into the world lately and it's television. <laughs> well, my interpreter had spent five minutes explaining to them what television was they have never seen. But it is an addiction, do you know that? And they have tested in schools telling children for 24 hours not to watch the television and they are just like people coming off drugs. So, you've heard it. Everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What we've noticed in places where the gospel has not penetrated there's a degree of enthusiasm when it comes there that is not seen in most Western churches. I will never forget the enthusiasm in Moscow last May. Tears come to my eyes when I think about it. Those people were excited. And I want to tell you the gospel is exciting. If you've ceased to be excited by the gospel, you, you haven't really you don't any longer realize what it is. You were lost. You were condemned to hell. You were going there where you deserved to go. And you had no hope. And Jesus intervened to save you. People don't like to talk about hell today, but there's a lot about it in the Bible and most of what is said about hell is said by Jesus. I was preaching in Germany just recently this year, no, not last year, and I spoke about being saved from hell. And my interpreter, who was a very good interpreter, and I understand German, said, being saved from a lost eternity. I said, brother, I didn't say that, I said hell. And I realized how reluctant people are to contemplate hell. But it is the destination of every person that does not live for God. And that's where we all deserve to go. And if you once realize that you've been saved from hell, you'll get excited. <laughs> I have another little example. I gave it in Moscow about the word justify, which sounds such a theological word. And uh, people say, well, I'm justified by faith. But they don't really know what it means. It means to be acquitted, to be found not guilty, to be reckoned righteous, to be made righteous. And I gave a little picture, come up here, sweetheart. I, may, I gave a little picture of a man in a court being tried for a crime which carried a mandatory death sentence. And he was sitting there waiting for the judge to pronounce the verdict. And the judge said, not guilty. And I said, when he met his wife afterwards, he didn't say that was a nice meeting. He said, honey, I don't have to die. I'm free. Hallelujah. 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 How many of you go out of a meeting like that? That's the truth. That's what justification is. You and you, furthermore, you were guilty. The truth of the matter is that Jesus took your guilt upon himself. That's why the judge says not guilty. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what he did. Now, 
One more question, very simple one. How do you purify yourself? Now we could spend hours on this, but I want to give you just one scripture. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. Speaking to believers, he says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, to sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So how do we purify our souls? By obeying the truth. Not by knowing the truth, but by obeying the truth. And what is the result of obeying the truth? It's fervent love for one another. Paul said, to Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love. Out of a pure heart, a good conscience, an unfeigned faith. Do we recognize that? What are we aiming at? Why do we hold meetings? What is the purpose of preaching? Do we ever score a goal? What would you think of a football team? And I mean, I have to think in terms of soccer because I don't understand American football but they're running up and down across the field, backwards and forwards, passing the ball from one another, but they never aim at the goal. That's like a lot of churches. Because the goal of our instruction is what? Love. And if we don't achieve that, we haven't scored. So purifying your heart comes through obeying the truth, not just knowing the truth or quoting the truth, but obeying the truth. And it leads to unfeigned love of the brethren, our fellow believers. And listen, I've been a believer 50, 50, 52 years. And I know some other believers are not easy to love. I mean, you might not be <laughs> bold enough to say that, but I am. God has got some strange children. <laughs> you know what uh, somebody said? You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> and John said, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. What's the evidence? Love. That's the result of a purified heart. All right, the other and the final recommendation I have, if you can call it a recommendation, that God requires of us to be his people is to make Jesus central in your life. I was preaching on Revelation last Sunday, as a matter of fact. No, the Sunday before last. And I was preaching on the first seven chapters of Revelation. And as I was preaching, I got a revelation. It's the position of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, John heard this voice like a trumpet speaking behind him. And then in verse 12 it says, Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. That was Jesus. What were the lampstands? It tells us, the churches. Where was Jesus? In the middle. And that's the only place he belongs, is in the middle. And then you go on to Revelation chapter 5, and John was weeping because no one could open the scroll that contained God's plan for the close of the age. And one of the elders said, don't weep. I'll read it, verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll to loose its seven seals. Just let me point out to you that Jesus is still the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And you know the word that comes from Judah is Jew. He didn't become a Jew just for 33 years. 
he is eternally identified with the Jewish people. And you better be careful of your attitude to them. So, John turned to see the lion. And he was shocked by what he saw. I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. See, that's the demonstration of God's power. God's power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God and the foolishness of the God is the cross. And through the cross, Jesus became the lion of the tribe of Judah. In other words, if you fight for your rights, you lose them. If you lay them down, God will restore them to you. Before honor is humility. Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos, and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. I have another little example. I gave it in Moscow about the word justify, which sounds such a theological word. And uh, people say, well, I'm justified by faith. But they don't really know what it means. It means to be acquitted, to be found not guilty, to be reckoned righteous, to be made righteous. And I gave a little picture, come up here sweetheart. I, may, I gave a little picture of a man in a court being tried for a crime which carried a mandatory death sentence. And he was sitting there waiting for the judge to pronounce the verdict. And the judge said, not guilty. And I said, when he met his wife afterwards, he didn't say, that was a nice meeting. <laughs> he said, honey, I don't have to die. I'm free. Hallelujah. 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 How many of you go out of a meeting like that? That's the truth. That's what justification is. You, and you, furthermore, you were guilty. The truth of the matter is, but Jesus took your guilt upon himself. That's why the judge says not guilty. Not because of anything you've done, but because of what he did. Now, one more question, very simple one. How do you purify yourself? Now, we could spend hours on this, but I want to give you just one scripture. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 22. Speaking to believers, he says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, to sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So how do we purify our souls? 
by obeying the truth. Not by knowing the truth, but by obeying the truth. And what is the result of obeying the truth? It's fervent love for one another. Paul said to Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love. Out of a pure heart, a good conscience, an unfeigned faith. Do we recognize that? What are we aiming at? Why do we hold meetings? What is the purpose of preaching? Do we ever score a goal? What would you think of a football team? And I mean, I have to think in terms of soccer because I don't understand American football. But they're running up and down across the field, backwards and forwards, passing the ball from one another, but they never aim at the goal. That's like a lot of churches. Because the goal of our instruction is what? Love. And if we don't achieve that, we haven't scored. So purifying your heart comes through obeying the truth. Not just knowing the truth or quoting the truth, but obeying the truth. And it leads to unfeigned love of the brethren. And John said, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. What's the evidence? Love. That's the result of a purified heart. All right, the other and the final recommendation I have, if you can call it a recommendation, that God requires of us to be his people is to make Jesus central in your life. I was preaching on Revelation last Sunday, as a matter of fact. No, the Sunday before last. And I was preaching on the first seven chapters of Revelation. And as I was preaching, I got a revelation. That's the position of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, John heard this voice like a trumpet speaking behind him. And then in verse 12 it says, Having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. That was Jesus. What were the lampstands? It tells us, the churches. Where was Jesus? In the middle. And that's the only place he belongs, is in the middle. And then you go on to Revelation chapter 5. And John was weeping because no one could open the scroll that contained God's plan for the close of the age. And one of the elders said, don't weep. I'll read it, verse 5. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll to loose its seven seals. Just let me point out to you that Jesus is still the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And you know the word that comes from Judah is Jew. He didn't become a Jew just for 33 years. He is eternally identified with the Jewish people. And you better be careful of your attitude to them. So John turned to see the lion and he was shocked by what he saw. I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. See that's the demonstration of God's power. God's power is made perfect in weakness. Paul says the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God and the foolishness of the God is the cross. And through the cross, Jesus became the lion of the tribe of Judah. In other words, if you fight for your rights, you lose them. If you lay them down, God will restore them to you. Before honor is humility. 
It says in Philippians chapter 2, it describes first of all the seven downward steps that Jesus took culminating in the death of the cross. And the next word that follows is therefore God has also highly exalted him. Don't miss out the therefore. Why was Jesus exalted? Because he had humbled himself. And Jesus said himself, everyone who exalts himself will be abased. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. And because Jesus humbled himself to the lowest, therefore God exalted him to the highest. And so the lion is the lamb that was slain. But notice, he's in the midst of the lampstands. He's in the midst of the throne and the elders. There's only one place that you can rightfully give Jesus. And that is the center of your life. If he's out of the center, your life is out of balance. I'm very weak on the history of science, but I do know enough to know that for many centuries, men believed that the sun revolved around the earth. Because that's the way it appears. Then I think it was a man named Copernicus, but correct me if I'm wrong, forgive me if I'm wrong, said no. It isn't the way it seems. Actually, the earth revolves around the sun. We've got things wrong. And for that, Galileo was almost put to death by the church, incidentally. That's interesting. The church has not always been favorable to new discoveries. And, uh, but I want to use that as a little illustration. See, the much contemporary preaching is this. God will meet your need. If you're sick, he'll heal you. If you're poor, he'll give you money, etc. That's a mistake. Because what it produces is self-centered Christians. God is there to meet my need. Now it is true that God does meet our needs, but that's a totally wrong perspective. We are there to glorify God. God doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around God. And if your life hasn't got Jesus in the center, you're off balance. You're really not in line for the purposes of God in your life. And if there are those of here, here this morning who cannot honestly say, Jesus is the center of my life, my life revolves around him before anyone else. Before my husband, my wife, my children, my job, my finance. Jesus is the center. Then you're off balance. And very likely you're amongst those whom Paul described as of all men the most miserable. You've lost your vision of eternity. Now, I want to close with just one more beautiful thought. In Revelation chapter 5, where we've been just a little further, in verse 9, the elders, if I don't remember rightly, it was the elders, yes, sang a new song to the Lamb, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed men to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made them kings and a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Notice that the redemption is out of every tribe, tongue or language, people and nation. So there has to be in the redeemed a representative from every tribe, people, language and nation. That's one main reason why I am a firm supporter of the Wycliffe translators. Because their aim is to get the scripture translated into every human language. They still have about 2,000 languages to go. Did you know that? 
there are still about 2,000 languages that have no scripture in them at all. I don't work with them, but I support them. Because they take God seriously. There has to be somebody there from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. I was wondering as I was sitting here how to explain the difference between a people and a nation. And let me give you an example, very interesting. The Assyrians, they're not living where Assyria was, that's been taken over by Saddam Hussein, who doesn't belong there. But the Assyrians speak Aramaic, and that was the first language that Jesus ever preached in, was Aramaic. It was the language used in, in the land of Israel in his day. Now there are three million Assyrians in the world, but they don't, they're not a nation. They're a people, but not a nation. Until 1948, the Jews were a people, but not a nation. So, there has to be at least one out of every people, nation, tribe, and tongue. So you know what God is waiting for? He's waiting for that special people that's taken from every single tribe, nation, people, and tongue. And until that's complete, He'll go on, in spite of all the evil, in spite of all the wickedness, in spite of all the suffering. Because his one supreme aim is a people for his son. And because Jesus gave his life for every man, woman and child, there has to be at least one representative before the throne, among the redeemed, out of every kind and class of humanity. Let me close by reading Peter's own explanation of this. You remember the question that I asked was, why does God tolerate for so many centuries the unbelievable evil that's in the earth? And I have an experience now and then at nights I become aware of evil, not some specific evil, but just the general presence and power of evil. And it is overpowering. And I realize that's what the world is like. And I have one remedy which I'll offer to you. When I realize that, I say this, I thank God I'm in Christ. No matter what evil there is, I'm in Christ. But it's at times it has been almost overpowering to realize the evil in the world today. And it's not going to decrease, it's going to increase. Why is God waiting? Well, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what is God waiting for? He's waiting for the elect, the ones he's chosen out of every tribe, people, tongue, and nation. And until there's one at least, he will not close the age. And if you want the age to close, you know what you need to do? Commit yourself to reaching the unreached and teaching the untold. That's the most practical thing that any of us can do against the suffering that's in the world today. Because God will not close the age until he has a special people for Jesus, redeemed by the blood from every people, tribe, tongue, and nation. 
Now I've spoken about a problem that's general. But I think it would be right for me to come down to the individual. And I want to suggest to you that there are some of you here this morning who are not living the way you ought to live. You've been touching the unclean thing with your thoughts, maybe even in your actions. And you cannot honestly say, Jesus is the center of my life. You've put other things before him. Ruth and I love one another dearly. We work together continually. But Ruth is not number one in my life. Jesus is. I'm not number one in her life. Jesus is. And that helps our marriage. It doesn't hinder it. It helps it. Where people are self-centered, it tends to break down a marriage. So I want to give an opportunity to those of you who want to change. In old-fashioned language, you want to repent. You want to change your mind. You've been living wrong. You haven't had eternity in view. You haven't had Jesus as a center. And you've come to realize that this morning and you want to change. If that's so, I would invite anybody that really wants to make a transaction with the Lord today on that basis to stand up, come out of their place and come to the front. We'll wait a little, we're not in a hurry. Let me just say, I hope I won't embarrass this young man who came forward. Some years ago, he was delivered from the demon of alcohol through my prayers, is that right? Now he's let it come back. And he's come forward this morning to be delivered once again. If the elders and the workers would come and be ready. Because I believe we need to pray for some of these people. Ruth would be ready to come. You can come much further forward than other people when you come behind you. Remember why I'm asking you to come. I'm not saying you're a wicked person, but I'm saying that your life is out of balance. Jesus isn't at the center. And tonight, today, you want to make him the center. You've lost the vision of eternity. You've just been living for the things of this time, this world. And it doesn't make you happy. As Paul says, you'll be of all men the most miserable. When you lose the vision of eternity. We're going to wait a little longer because there's others that need to come. Just the fact that you're right at the back of the building doesn't make any difference. You can take a few extra steps. You're not coming to meet with Brother Prince. You're coming for a fresh encounter with Jesus. Or maybe the first encounter with Jesus. Jeff, where are you? I want to say there are some old Christians here and your Christianity has got old and it needs to be revived. I could stop but I know that there are more. I'm particularly talking to people that have been Christians for 20 or 30 years but you've lost your first love. 
And you remember what the Lord said to the church of Philadelphia, repent. Remember from where you've fallen. To lose your first love is a fall. And it can only be remedied by repentance. The fear of man is keeping people from God. The fear of man is keeping people from God. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. And some of you are snared by the fear of what other people will think. You better get rid of that snare. When I was in Kenya, the Africans used to snare birds by making a, a loop of grass and putting it in front of the place where they knew the bird would run. And then the bird would run into it and it would tighten around the bird's throat. And some of you have got a snare around your throat. You're afraid to speak. You're afraid to witness. You're afraid to take a public stand for the Lord. Even in your own families, you don't really let people know where you stand. Jeff, do you want to say anything? I would like the, um, the workers to come maybe up on the platform if you can. Those of you elders and people like that. Or at any rate, come up this, end, this side. Because I believe we need to lay hands on these people today. I don't normally do this. But I believe today that God wants us to lay hands. Not to pray a long prayer but just to lay hands on those that have come forward. I know that some of you have come with real, deep, long-standing problems. God can resolve those problems. If you meet Jesus the way he really is, it doesn't take him a long time to solve those problems. Is Denise here? Is Denise here? Denise, would you come up too? Let's have our whole altar team, the deacons, deaconesses, elders, just come and work your way face the people who have responded. So come quickly. We are going to minister to you. Just each one wherever we happen to come. Don't seek out some special person. Don't fix your eyes on me because I'm not the deliverer. Jesus is. You meet Jesus. That will solve your problems. Now I would like you to just say a short prayer after me. Those of you that have come forward. Just word, sentence by sentence after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died for me to save me from hell and give me eternal life. And Lord, I want to lay hold of that life. I want to make sure this morning that I'm not going to end in hell. Lord, only you can save me. I give myself to you. I put you right in the center of my life. And I give you leave to do whatever you want with me. Here I am, Lord Jesus. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.